So who loves Cabernet Sauvignon? More like, who doesn't? It's the most famous grape in the world and produces some of the best wines out there. And for some of the best examples of these wines, we're going to California for this weekly tasting. Let's explore Napa and Sonoma. How did these two regions come to be the home to some of America's finest wines? And what makes them so great? Is one better than the other? And what differentiates them? So let's talk a little bit about that and more in this weekly tasting. Cabernet Sauvignon can be genetically traced back to its roots in Bordeaux, France, where it makes some of the highest quality and most celebrated wines like Chateau Margaux and Lafitte Rothschild. In the 1800s, during the era of steamship travel, Manifest Destiny and the California Gold Rush, European immigrants brought wine grapes to California in one of the largest mass migrations in history. Winemakers have long recognized that the area to the north of San Francisco was prime grape growing territory. They've been perfecting the craft since this land was a part of Mexico in the 1700s and over the ages learned by experience that Cabernet Sauvignon loves this place. For some reason, people love to pit Napa against Sonoma, but the truth is that they're more similar than different. Like two fraternal twins, they've been together since the beginning. Each one is blessed and beautiful in its own way, but they typically move together. Both viticultural areas run north to south along the edge of Northern California. And what are some of the best geographical locations in the world for winemaking? And although each gets its climate from a relatively different source, they're quite similar too. Further inland of the two, Napa gets its Mediterranean climate from the San Pablo Bay, which channels cool air and foggy breezes into the valley, where they combine with the hot, dry air to create a perfectly balanced environment for grapevines. And Sonoma, which is closer to the ocean, capitalizes on proximity to the Pacific for its warm and sunny days and cool, clear nights. And grapevines love this daily warming and cooling cycle, which is known as a diurnal swing. It produces grapes that manage to be ripe and juicy while at the same time bright and acidic. Sonoma can actually lay claim to having one of the first commercial wineries in California, which is Buena Vista. And Buena Vista's founder is often credited with being the man who brought Cabernet here. But no surprise, Napa Valley is right there alongside of Sonoma, producing its first wines in 1857. And it gets credit for putting California on the world stage, when a Napa Cabernet first beat French Bordeaux in a blind tasting competition in 1976. And some wine historians theorize that the judgment of Paris was the pivotal moment that split the two regions, setting Napa on a course for fame and fortune, while leaving Sonoma to relative silence. And that's where we come to the differences. Obviously, Napa has had a lot more notoriety, so it's almost become a brand in its own right. Aside from the opulent wineries, there are high-end car dealerships, luxury spas, it's the destination of movie stars, and home to the famous auction Napa Valley. Around here, vineyard property sells for about a million dollars an acre. Sonoma is considered to be more laid back, spread out, quiet, and bucolic. But don't let that fool you, Sonoma is equally as formidable and in demand. It just manages to come off being more humble because it never played the fame game. So it seems the battle of Napa versus Sonoma is more of a cultural war than anything else. Both are equally important in the story of California wine. So now it's time to taste them. From the Dry Creek region of Sonoma, this is Julia. And Dry Creek is a tributary of the Russian River Valley, and it's known for that wide diurnal swing that I was talking about, where you get those warm days and cool nights, producing wines that are higher in acid. And the reason this is considered a reserve is because it spends a year and a half in American and French oak barrels. All right, swirl, sniff, and taste. The first thing that jumps out at me is cranberry flavors. And it's interesting because uh, when we were talking about the differences between Napa and Sonoma, some people will tell you that they think that Sonoma has a little bit more of a red fruit essence to it, whereas Napa Valley wines tend to be more black fruit or dark fruits. There's a waxy smokiness here, almost like somebody snuffed out a candle that's coming from the oak barrels. This wine has a lot of fire, a lot of black pepper spice in there too, and the tannins are pretty tight, but when they relax, they finally give way to this vanilla spice kind of flavor. Well, if there's any truth to the notion that Sonoma Cabernet tends to be more acidic and also exhibits a lot of red fruits, here's your proof. This is the uh, 2018 Terroir. This wine is actually a blend of three different grapes, but in the state of California, if you use at least 75% of one grape, you can call it that. And there's some Merlot and Cabernet Franc in here too, so it'll be interesting to see if we can detect that. There's a savoriness here in this wine, almost like a beefiness or a meatiness, and I suspect that's coming from the Cabernet Franc grape. Now, Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon is notorious for having these dark, 
uh, berry fruit flavors, things like blueberries and blackberries, which are in there. But overall, to me, it's a more savory and, like I said, a meaty wine, even with some dried herbs in there at the end. There's a real pleasant umami quality to this wine, which would make it perfect for pairing with foods that are equally as savory. This is the Hook and Ladder 2019 Chalk Hill Cabernet Sauvignon. And once again, Chalk Hill is located in the Russian River Valley of Sonoma. All right, let's get in there. And this is a soft and plush wine. It reminds me a little bit of stewed prunes or plums. And there's a spice element in there, like a little bit of cinnamon or brown sugar. Relative to the rest of Sonoma, Chalk Hill is slightly warmer, which translates to slightly higher alcohol. 14.5% in this case. Gives the wine a nice silky body. There's a real soft caramel sensation on the finish, which I find really pleasing. I could imagine just drinking it on its own, but if you were going to partner it up with food, I would lean towards desserts. This is the Muscatine Vineyard 2018 Napa Cab. And with only 750 vines, this winery only produces about two tons of grapes or two barrels of wine per year. This is a family-owned winery, and as you see on the label here, there's a sea anemone. Now, the owner has since passed away, but the mother and son still run the winery. The mother's in her 80s, and she prunes the vines herself. I can't wait to taste this one. Oh, that smells so good. The acid is nice and fresh and manages to keep the wine balanced. This wine brings it with 15.4% alcohol. It's intense. It's got that classic perfumey, heady, sweet cassis in there that you would expect from Cabernet Sauvignon with a touch of brown sugar. At just 48 cases of wine per year, this is a true small production boutique winery, and you can actually taste that in the quality. It's a privilege to be able to drink a wine like this. Cabernet Sauvignon often gets pigeonholed as being a steak wine, and while it is, it's so much more versatile. So let's talk about some food pairings that I think show a little more diversity. And this is one of those situations where I think all four recipes can work with all four of these wines, so universal pairings. But when there's a specific pairing that I think would work really well, I'll make a recommendation. A bacon cheeseburger is almost a no-brainer. This is gonna be delicious with all of these Cabernet Sauvignons, but particularly the ones that have some smoky elements to them. The Julia Cabernet Reserve has that smokiness I'm talking about. A savory, earthy, wild mushroom galette is gonna be perfect for our earthy wines. And specifically, I'm thinking that earthy, meaty Cabernet from Terroir. Perfect for the summertime, smoky BBQ ribs. Probably will work with all of these wines here, but three of these wines exhibited some really dark, juicy berry fruits, and I think they would be perfect with those ribs. And of course, we have to end with dessert. There's a mixed berry cobbler with streusel. And the last two wines in this tasting exhibited some sweet dessert-like qualities, so that would be my recommendation. As much as we'd love to make it a competition, it turns out that Napa and Sonoma are and have been inseparable from the start. Both are equally important in the story of California wine, especially Cabernet Sauvignon. The great news is that we get to enjoy all of it without having to compare. To me, it's always about getting the most out of the glass that's right in front of you. Thanks so much for joining me today. Cheers.